So I have a question. Yeah. Do you chew gum all the time? No. Like I don't even I don't even know the last time I've owned gum. Well then what in the hell is with all the actors with gum in their mouth or butchering the Boston accent? Well, Mark Ruffalo was the biggest offense of that. It drove me crazy watching him talk. Like, I mean, he's great. I love him. But man, we don't chew gum that much. I'm just saying. It's just, what is it about people and thinking Boston has that really over-the-top accent? Do we have that accent? I don't understand. I mean, when you get closer, we're like an hour out of Boston. So when you get closer to Boston, I do think we have like a thicker accent, but I don't think we'd sound like that. It's not the, I'm going to pack the car at Javi Yad. <laughs> no. The... So that was our co-host, Max, who you've probably heard in the background. Uh, she's been scuttering around on numerous episodes. Yeah, she's basically our, our background noise uh, aficionado. Yeah. So back to the accents. Just really why? I don't know. I haven't found a movie with really good Boston accents. I, yeah, I can't think of one off the top of my head. I mean, unless you want to count Goodwill Hunting because he's most of them are actually from Boston. But even that is a little over the top. Well, right. It's an exaggerated accent, but at the same time... He's allowed to have that accent because he's from Southie. Right. So. so. Okay. Anyway, so what movie are we doing this week? Uh, this week we're doing Spotlight, which is a movie that came out fairly recently. Yeah. 2015? 2015. Uh, fantastic movie. I loved it. It's about a rather uncomfortable topic. It's about the Boston Globe uncovering the Catholic Church abuse scandal. For all the priests, which just is not a putting Boston in a great light. No, we're not doing well with that at all. Every movie that we've had that's related to Boston has not put it in a great light that I can remember. I know I, Tanya, they said that all people from Boston are fishermen, so that's not true. I don't and know how to fish. Borderline regionalist racism. Yeah, but I mean, okay, it's fine. I understand. I don't know much about where they were from either, so. All I know about... Oregon is that it's full of hippies. Oh, see, so, I mean, we're doing great with the whole regionalism thing, so that's fine. So, anyway, so, yeah, this is kind of an uncomfortable topic for our city, but it's true. And I think I read somewhere that John McCarthy, the director of the movie, his intent was not to focus on putting the Catholic Church in a bad light, but rather to focus on journalism and the power of investigative journalism. Um, I think that... put that in a good light. Which I appreciate because, I mean, that's what I went to school for was journalism. And although print is kind of dying, it is nice to see how, um, it, you know, good journalism can really have an impact. Well, now that you say that, it does give – the movie did give me a feel like they were focusing on the journalism, uh, journalist ac- aspect of it in terms of doing all the, the digging and getting your facts straight, getting sources lined up and uh, – just sitting down and putting in the time, really, it was a long, long, long process for them, it seemed like. Right, right. Uh, and, I mean, this specific team, I think, is a real team. I'd never heard of it before, but um, called Spotlight. They're, they were known to, like, spend, like, six to eight months, like, really getting all of the information and diving deep and, like, not just having those, like, glossed over stories that you see, like, from the day before kind of thing, like, thrown together. But um, so they they spent a lot of time really making sure they got their facts straight, which I I appreciate because we don't really get that, especially in the age of um, social media and all of that. You get like blurbs and people are posting out things before. Well, it's better to be first rather than being right. Well, I mean, well, it's better to be both. But (laughs) I mean, that's the thought process is it's better to be first. But I mean, really, I would think it's better to be right. But because we're so used to now everything happens now like you go past an accident and if you want to know when it what what just happened you can like google like accident on 95 and you'll probably find out what happened yes yeah, like, smartphones and age of internet have spoiled us in terms of getting everything right away rather than sitting there t- taking the time to process things or reading about it in the newspaper to get a more balanced view of what happened rather than just a snapshot or you don't know the whole story. Right. So, I mean, looking at the film from that perspective, I I mean, it's not as uncomfortable for one thing. And it, 
I mean, I really appreciate that because I don't know of a lot of movies that really focus on the journalism side. I'm sure there are, but I'm not familiar with a lot of them. Me neither. I think before we go any further, we have to do the intro. This is Cinematically Correct. I'm Tyler. I'm Shay. And again, the movie Spotlight. So if you know of any journalist movies, we're interested to find out because I enjoyed this movie and that whole aspect of it. Uh, so please, if you're listening and you know of a good movie about journalists, please let us know. Yeah. I think Rachel McAdams was in one of them. Yeah, I did read she was in a uh, movie, what was it called? Uh, the State of Play? State of Play with Russell Crowe. Yeah, I mean, I haven't seen it. I just saw the trailer, but it looks great. So um, so this movie, I actually didn't realize that this movie started out this way until I did the research because apparently I slept at the beginning. I don't know <laughs> what happened. But at the beginning of the movie, Father Gogan. Gagan. Gagan. I don't... How do you know how it's said? Because... I remember the news pieces about it. It's Father Gagan. Okay, Mr. I have to correct everything. Anyway, he was arrested in 1976, and the district attorney um, asked that the press not get wind of it and wanted to kind of repress the story because... Sweep it under the rug. Yeah, they wanted to hide this scandal. So that was kind of the beginning of the movie, seeing that that was um, being kept under wraps, and that was the beginning of you know, this whole thing being uncovered. Right. So the Catholic Church is a very large presence in Boston, which I don't know if if institutions like that have the same clout that they do elsewhere in the country. I mean, the Catholic Church is the Catholic Church in in Boston, and that's for the longest time that was the rule. It really still is. I mean, mean, you have some of that in the South, I would imagine, for the Southern Baptists and all those evangelicals where – Church is obviously a big part of the community, but it doesn't have the same institutional feel where the Catholic Church has been around for forever. Where the separation of church and state is a little murky. (laughs) Uh, There's not so much in in Boston (laughs) because everyone that I know went to Mass growing up. Uh, Yeah, I mean, I I don't know if it's as prevalent now going like outside because we're in the outskirts. I know... I mean, my family, we all went to church growing up, and I know all my friends went to church growing up. Right. But nowadays, I'm not so sure. I don't know. I mean, I'd have to ask, like, some of the people that are still in school, like, how that is. But Well, I think this scandal actually changed a lot of that dynamic because I know a lot of people that stopped going to church over this issue. Hmm. Well, I didn't realize that. I don't, I don't know anybody that stopped because of that, but that's interesting. So... The, the church just takes the reins and has all of the politicians and the police officers in the pocket for the longest time. Uh, then a new uh, editor of the Boston Globe gets appointed, uh, Marty Baron, uh, played by Liv Schreiber. And he reads a piece about Father Gagan being arrested for abusing children, and he wants the spotlight team to follow up on that because they're not doing anything really. They have a couple of stories in the works, but nothing... Well, that's not how they felt. They felt like they were working on another story that they would like to finish, but he felt this was something that needed to be. Right, and he's the editor, so he gets to do what he wants. Right. So. uh, So they do begin to work on that, um, on the angle that they are trying to find out more about the Gagan um, scandal. Right. Their focus is to find out more about what happened and, like, what the church covered up in regards to Gagan himself. Right. Their first thought process was that the church was involved in moving Father Gagan around to other parishes to let him abuse more children. Right. Uh, and it was, they thought, an isolated incident. And then they do the research and they find another priest and so forth. They get in touch with uh, SNAP. The SNAP organization, yeah. Uh, which puts them on the line for finding 13 priests Right, and when they talked to the SNAP organization, they uh, it, the guy that came in said, like, hey, I sent you all of this stuff, like, years ago. It's not my fault you did nothing with it. And he was pretty upset, understandably. And even when he was telling them everything, I think it was – I want to say it was Robinson, but I can't be sure if it was him, who was like, yeah, but that guy's crazy. Like, why are you listening to him? He's kind of like a nut job. Right. So, I mean, it kind of reminds me of, like – a lot of other, like, people who come out um, for not just sexual abuse, but, you know, um, also domestic abuse, things like that. People are always like, that person's nuts. Don't listen to him when it's a high-profile person. Right. 
So it's it's funny to see that that's that's the first reaction is well the person's crazy even though he had like paperwork and he had documentation, documentation like of he all had sources like he had like that's a term paper that you could hand in right. was what he had and it's just uh, from his perspective he's upset about it because he thinks that not, them not reporting this and them not doing anything is going to lead to more children being victimized and I'd be upset about that too right I mean, one more child being abused is too many children. Right. And, I mean, I looked into the SNAP organization, and they are still very active right now. And, you know, there was some articles. I didn't go through everything, but there were articles on their website about current scandals. So, I mean, I don't know if things are still happening or if there are current scandals that are coming out now from back then. Like, I'm not sure. But they're still very active, and they're still, you know, very much out there. I would say it's probably a mix of both. I mean... Even if the Catholic Church was able to fix it, they can't fix it 100%. Well, I mean, I mean, most I'm sure many professions where there's children involved have this type of scandal. I think the problem with the church is one it's the church, so you would expect them to be held to a higher standard. Well, they have the moral high ground or at least they're supposed they're to They're supposed have. to. But also, too, they covered it up for so long that I think that makes it right. a bigger problem. Well, it was uh, it was more about protecting the image of the church and not protecting children. I mean, they're fucking children. Well, I, I mean, whoa. not... Whoa, whoa. And n- I didn't mean it that way, but it also fits. I mean, I don't know if I heard of any that actually... Did that? Went that far, but all right, all right. I'm fairly confident in some of them... I don't want to know. I don't want to know. I really don't either, but <laughs> so. that's just... That's, that's the thought in my head that means that they're horrible people, and... They deserve everything that come, comes to them in terms of going to prison and all that stuff. Oh, we'll get into that. I don't... Okay. Yeah. We'll get into that later when we get so, there. So they, they they find a list of 13 names and they start fact-checking that. And then they speak to... They don't find the list. It's well, not people giving them a list. Right. But, and then they reach out to an expert in the field. Yeah. I think his name was Richard Spire. Sipe. I, I have. Sipe. Okay. A uh, former priest who works in the medical profession. Married, I know that name is wrong, but okay. Married a nun. Uh, and they're talking to him about the 13. He goes, and they're like, so does that number sound right to you? And he says, no, actually, that number sounds low. My my estimates put it somewhere at 90. Right. I mean, he would know because he spent a lot of time working to rehabilitate these priests. Yes. So he he's really kind of in that field and he would know. So. Right. That and number sounds crazy coming from him. Well, he said it was something like 6% abused children, which that seems like a very high number. Right. And then something like 50% are not celibate, meaning that they have sex with either men or women. Right, adults. Well, adults, yes. So priests are having I sex. I mean, is that surprising to you? I mean, come on. It is. If you're taking a vow, I mean, you're supposed to hold on to that vow. Okay. And how many marriages do you think end in divorce because of cheating? I. You took a vow, didn't you? You did. In the church, most of the time. But it's, I don't know how it's different. It just is different. Oh. Because they're a priest. That their, their vow human. is supposed to be more important. They're people. I get that. And you know what? now if after this movie, it makes sense. Have an affair, as long as it's with an adult, I'm good with it. Have an affair. Well, it, it was interesting because growing up in in my in my parish, uh, our priest drove a BMW, and priests are also supposed to have a vow of modesty and poverty. And so one of the kids in my class, one of the teenagers are being an ass, was like, "Hey, father, what's with the BMW? Shouldn't you be driving like a, a Honda?" And he's like, "I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't." Go out and gamble. I don't do anything like this. I don't have any other voice vices. Let me have this one. I mean, my childhood priest growing up was a partier. He was known to get, you know, drunk with all the people. And he was a good guy. There's nothing wrong with him. But I don't think that's the image you would think of as a priest. No. But, no. but you know, that's what he did. And that was his thing. So I'm sure some people's thing was sleeping with people. It I is mean, what it is. I suppose it's fair. As long as they're an adult, that's, I mean, I have... Right, I'm fine with it. I mean, what I have a little bit of a problem with it other than, but not really because oh, it's... Oh, Judgy McJudgerson, please. I'm sure you've done something that you shouldn't do. Probably. Okay, then. So... Nothing that I'll admit to on a recording. <laughs> 
Nice try there. Well, I mean, let's be honest. You have an Alexa over there. Everything you say is being recorded, so it's Yo, fine. Yeah, and you make fun of me for saying that it's a wiretap that you bought and put in your house. First of all, I didn't buy it. Second of all, I'm not making fun of you for that. I'm making fun of you for the fact that you have a cell phone. You have all these other things. You're going to be recorded. It don't matter. Yeah, privacy is dead. Basically. Anyway, so they find out there's 90 priests, but then they get a little bit derailed because 9-11 happens. And yes. And they have to kind of put it on hold for obvious reasons. Um, well, because 9-11 was a national tragedy. This is also a national tragedy, but it is different because... But it was more, I feel like it was in a more immediate um, need for coverage. Well, right, because everyone knew what happened, whereas this story, they had still kept it largely under wraps, so not very many people knew other than the... Well, and also I think um, with this, the priest story, a lot of it was uncovering past victims, Right. where this was current, kind of like at the time during 9-11, we didn't know if that was... The first of many attacks, we didn't... I mean, I know when I was in school, my my dad worked in Boston, so did my brother, and we thought Boston was next. That was our thought process was, while they hit a bunch of the big cities, Boston's clearly next. So I think that was part of the thought process was, you know, we could be next. We need to get this out there so people know that our city is kind of... Well, I mean, the big cities to hit are New York, L.A., Chicago, Boston, Philadelphia. Right. I mean, it's just so – and Washington, D.C., which happened. I was just well, a huge – Philadelphia, didn't, didn't a plane get knocked down going uh, there? Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Yeah. Uh, I believe it was headed to the White House, actually. I don't think they really knew, but that was but the guess, they, yeah. They took it down in a bunch of heroes, United, United, United 93. Right. So, I mean, that I think that was kind of the reason. I don't think it was, like, anything's more important. It was more of, like, we could actually lose people's lives, and we don't know what scale, because we didn't know really what was going on or why it was happening at the time. I just remember sitting there in high school watching it happen on TV, and the whole day it was just... Oh, you were in high school? That's cute. You're showing your age. I was in middle school. Oh, great. Yes. Eighth grade. For the record, I am older by a a year. (laughs) Year and a half. Yes. And you just had to get that out there. Well, yeah, since you, you mentioned you were in high school. So anyway, but yeah, so I think um, that derailed them. I forget what um, Mark Ruffalo's character was going to. It had something to do with 9-11, I feel like. So he was- uh, flight school. He was in Miami for where the terrorists learned how to fly planes. So he got uh, sidetracked with going to the court to get the documents that he was needing by having to go to f- to Miami to go to flight school. Right. So he had talked to Garabedian, which I don't think we mentioned who he is, but he was an attorney who um, had been fighting to basically get these voices heard and had been fighting for the victims um, for most of the time, I believe. And I, from what I'm reading, he's still kind of involved in some of this stuff. Good so. for him. I like him. He was one of the, the most likable people in this movie. Right. He was. But... Um, he the so he finds out from him Mark Ruffalo's character finds out from him that the documents that he's looking for are going to be public because he did some cool thing where oh it was he great he suckered the church right so he filed a motion and made those documents now public because the motion was a public motion right so the church filed a motion and he responded to the motion by attaching, attaching all of the exhibits that he wanted to and. I don't know how this is a thing, but it's a genius. I don't know the legal terms and so forth, but well done, sir. Right. Well done. So Hats off to you. He let um, Mark Ruffalo's character know, and he, but he said, you know, you're kind of on a on a clock here because if you don't get here, somebody else is going to get to them and they won't be here anymore. Right. So he had to turn around and come back, and he he went through a million hoops trying to get this because he gets there and it's closed and he stays overnight. And even when he gets let in, they say, no, you can't have the documents. And he had to go to the judge. And the judge finally said, yes, you can have them. He goes back. And the guy's like, no, you have to copy them. There's, He had to, like, pay him for the copy machine. Like, it was just like, are you insane? Like, obviously, the church has serious clout to be able to put him through that ringer. Well, the first time they had pulled the documents illegally from the building. Like, right. the church had destroyed evidence in a case, a legal case. Right. Which is a crime. You think? Yes, I do think, okay. actually. Well, 
So serious clout. But um, anyway, they do get it, and I think they win a case later on to get more documents. Well, they had requested to have the the whole case of uh, Mr. Garabedian uh, unsealed. So all of the records that were sealed, they wanted access to them under the uh, First Amendment freedom of speech and and so forth. And they were all taking bets on how long it would take this good Catholic girl judge to rule against them. <laughs> and somehow, m- magically, she just lets them have them. Right. And so they get all the documents, and it's, oh, my God, it's very clear that this was known by Cardinal Law, who's a scumbag. I think I'm safe in saying that. Like He helped cover up a child abuse on a massive scale, which makes him a horrible person. Not, I'm not commenting on that, but you, moving on from that, because I'm not going to call a cardinal that I don't know the rest of the story a scumbag when I don't know what kind of pressure he was getting or what kind of situation he was in, because I don't believe he actually did anything. He just moved the priests around. Uh, he just facilitated the abuse of children. I don't think you can say that fairly. You don't. Did you research enough to know that he was the one that facilitated it? Well, he was the one in charge of all... Pr- prior to this scandal coming out, it was handled by the cardinal at the, uh, at the archdiocese level, or rather than a central system that the, the pope can look at and... Right, but I think it's hard to say what you would do in that situation when he had never encountered something like this, and I'm sure that by the time he learned the scale of what was going on, he, it was already he he had already started putting in motion like stop gaps that it was kind of hard to backtrack himself. So I don't think it's fair to say that he's a terrible person when you don't really know how you would have reacted if you know maybe it was one person you're like okay do I want to take down a whole institution that's known for rehabilitating people and making them feel better and giving them hope and do I want to take down a whole institution for one guy and then when you start realizing there's more and more guys now it's too late you've already started a bad well, process. yes but if i know it's if i think it's one guy i'm not putting that guy back into circulation well no regardless of what happens i'm sure it's hard to just pull a priest like i'm sure that there's you know going to be stigma and then people are going to talk and then so I, i'm i'm sure there's more to it than we understand i mean maybe but at the same time i would like to think that i would want to at least on a moral level protect children in any way I'm sure we all like to believe that. I'm just saying. I think there's more to it than we get. But anyway, um, so I think right around this time, um, Rachel McAdams' character, Sasha, is that her name? Yes. Um, She realizes that these cases that have been being settled by the church are not public record. There's no court documents of them. So she goes to the lawyer who's been trying the cases, um, I think his name is McLeish. Yes, different than Garabedian. They're very separate lawyers. Right. One very... is good, one is kind of a scumbag. Right, and Mc... they find out that McLeish has been settling the cases out of court with the church so that basically so that the church There's no doesn't... record. Right. So she kind of comes after McLeish, and he... they portray him as a really shady, like terrible character. And for most of the movie, you like hate him. Hate him. Like, yeah. he... And he plays it really well. It's Billy Crudup. He's... I've only ever seen him in Sleepers. I've never seen him in anything else, but he's an awesome actor. Well, I saw him when he was all blue in The Watchmen. Oh, okay. So he plays Dr. Manhattan, uh, and Dr. Manhattan is a blue, basically god character. And so you can't really tell it's Billy Crudup because he's all blue with, like, Ah. CGI. Uh, But I wrote down Slimy Lawyer in the notes when we were watching the movie. And Mm -hmm. I'd seen this movie already, and I knew what happened later in the movie. You just forgot? I had forgotten. Right. So, anyway, uh, not it doesn't take them that long to figure out that he's actually not a slimy lawyer. He had compiled a list of the victims that he tried and the cases and sent them to the Boston Globe to actually one of the people that were was on the case. Damn in, you, Michael Keaton. Yeah, Michael Keaton's character, Robinson. Uh, Walter Robinson. Something like that. Yeah, so... You're kind of like, wait, what the heck? So he's actually not the bad guy. He did try to do something in the Boston Globe. Actually dropped the ball. They dropped the ball. Right. So. I think that the Boston Globe deserves immense credit for this because 
I don't know how they stumbled upon the story. I mean, Marty Baron put them on this and they, they didn't give up. And I'm sure it was not the easiest thing because I would imagine the majority of the writers for the Boston Globe are Catholic. Right. They are. I mean, from what I read, all of them were Roman Catholic. Right. It's just that's what happens in Boston. And they were going against the Catholic Church in a not a positive way. Although, I I just want to say that how did the Catholic Church not find out about this in a more and take proactive stances on this is baffling to me. When I'm reading through the actual information of what happened, mm -hmm. there are some really huge glaring warning signs. Like, uh, well, Paul Shanley, one of the priests that was abusing children, was at the founding meeting of NAMBLA. I don't know what NAMBLA is. NAMBLA is North American Man Boy Love Association. So it's it's an organization that believes that men and boys, children, should be in love and have relationships. Now, is this before he got caught or after? This is before he got caught in like the 60s, 70s. I, I mean, I don't, I don't even know what to do with that information. That's... It's a st just how... It's the worst thing ever. Is that still an organization? That's still a thing. Okay. Well, it's that should not be allowed to be a thing. Why is yeah. that allowed? Uh, freedom of speech. That's the same reason the Klan is still around. Uh, it, uh, okay. Hmm. Klan should not be a thing. Nazis no. shouldn't be a thing. No. But they're around. Okay, it's fair, but no, not fair. I don't even know a word <laughs> for that. Not fair, but you know what I mean. It's uh, uncomfortable. That's just information to have, I guess. Right. Really, there's no right. no positive about that at all. Right. Now, Shanley is the one, if I remember correctly, who is currently like 86 and just recently got released and is living across the street from a young girl's dance studio. Yes, he got released July 28, 2017. So he's been out of prison for about a year. He's 86, 87 right now. And a convicted pedophile is living across the street from a child's dance studio. Right. Which, granted, he's 87, but it's still, he's a convicted pedophile. Yeah, it's it's creepy on a lot of levels. <clears throat> I know that they interviewed the lady who owns a dance studio, and she's like, yeah, I'm putting a state-of-the-art security system in here, and I'm not letting my girls leave unless they're accompanied by an adult. The appropriate adult, not this particular adult. Right. <laughs> Preferably. Right. So, I mean, I don't know a lot about the other people that, um, the other priests, because there was far too many of them. It was like 127 yes. or something in the Boston area. I but, mean, the, the most well-known is... Paul Shanley and then John Gagan. John right. Gagan being number one. Uh, well, but he is not no longer with us. Well, yes, he was murdered in prison. Strangled. Uh, strangled and beaten by a Nazi. Uh, and I had heard originally when the story came out, there were conflicting reports that the person that had done it uh, was either abused by Gagan or was paid by someone abused by Gagan mm -hmm. to kill him. So... I mean, the gentleman was already in prison for a life sentence, so he had nothing to lose by killing another person. And I, it's not a, it's a little bit of an oversight by the Massachusetts Correctional Department to leave him with a convicted killer uh, when he's a known child abuser. Well, and right. they don't fare well in prison, especially if he's an old man. Well, right. But, I mean, I think it's also kind of sad for the families to see him get off without having to finish his sentence because i mean for a priest going to heaven is well this the the, that's the weirdest creepy thing about it is that in massachusetts if you die before you're convicted or it's, even after you're convicted it's wiped off your record right so because he died he's now clear of all the charges against him right so it's the presumably dumbest he weirdest can thing go to heaven presumably well i think that's a more philosophical well, that, that's theological debate because you have to actually want to be forgiven for the crimes that you've done. Well, the, the thought process out there that I was reading was that he probably made penance in jail. So having this absolved of him is... Well, really doing, doing penance and actually meaning that you're wanting to be forgiven for what you've done are two different things. Oh, goodness. Well, that's why it's a philosophical thing. I want to know what the actual numbers are. I mean, we've talked a lot about the numbers in terms of there's a lot of priests in Boston that were abusing children. I would imagine that at least a, a few of them were wrongly accused. Oh, well, of course. I mean, especially when this became public, I'm sure people came out for the 
and attention. But I, wanna, I also think there's people out there who haven't come out who did get right. abused. So that's that's the other side of it. I mean, I'm not saying that I don't believe any of the victims because obviously I'm inclined to believe a person that way versus someone saying, no, I didn't do anything when a, a, a row of people are saying, no, he did. Right, but in every... In every situation, there's always going to be a few that are taking advantage. I, I think that's unfortunately the case. Uh, one thing that I found amazing that I don't think I would have the strength to do is one of the victims in this movie, one of the actors in this movie that was playing a victim, was actually victimized himself by this scandal. And I don't think I could have done that. They, I don't think so a- either. But I mean, I feel like that's it was pr- probably inevitable that they would find at least one because there were so many. Well, if they're looking for Boston actors especially right. for this movie, um, there, there are a lot of Boston actors in this movie. I mean, what's his name was a BC High alum. I don't know who what's his name is. So. Uh, it's the guy who plays uh, Captain Jim Brass on CSI. I think it's Paul Guilfoyle. Oh. The, the guy that know. has a face that looks like it's been leatherized and punched punched a lot yeah i've got nothing so okay uh he's, he's a good actor i've enjoyed him in things but he's not a very good character in this movie uh but there's just a lot of that i just i still can't believe that someone that was a victim was playing a victim in this movie that just I, blows my mind yeah but i mean it's probably partly that he wanted his voice out there like he wanted to get the story out there not necessarily his story but the story of what happened right so I, I can understand why you would want to do that. But anyway, I um, I think that this movie really kind of shined a light on something that now we're dealing with when it comes to, like, the Me Too movement and things like that. And we're, we're realizing that this isn't just a priest thing. No, it's, this a, is on it's an a, issue. This is a larger scale, you know, uh, men in power, I guess, type movement i don't really know how like how to but i mean that's what it seems like is right now we're kind of focused on like the men in positions of power well right they had uh all of the me too movement coming out in terms of all of the uh, hollywood side being guilty of abuse right and i mean this started before the priest thing with the satanic ritual abuse scandal which happened in the 80s where it was basically the same thing except for for satanists they were being um accused of Um, molesting children um, but found out that well what I read was it found out the majority of the allegations were false and we're actually just trying to bring down the satanic cult I'm sure that some of them were true right I mean but um, I think that was kind of the start of this whole finding finding it out not find not it happening but it being found out I mean that makes sense because I believe that right or wrong it's wrong that people hate the Satanists more than they hate the Catholic Church. Catholic Church has a much better reputation, not at, not really after this, but they did. Which makes no sense to me, but we won't get into theological debates. Right. I just, they did a lot of clever things. Like they put a Penn State football game on in the background, and football fan, trivia nerd that I am. Uh, recognize Jerry Sandusky? Well, I didn't recognize him, but I recognized Penn State. Well, yeah, and I mean, and the scandal of Jerry Sandusky abusing children as a as a coach of Penn State. I, I'm sure most people recognize that because that was much more current. Right. Back to back Oscars for Michael Keaton, randomly. Yeah, I have not seen Birdman, so Me I don't. Neither. I can't say. Add it to the list? Question mark. Oh my goodness, that list! It's gonna kill us. This list is gonna never end, and we're <laughs> gonna die doing this list. Uh, you had a couple audience asks, I believe, before we wrap things up. Yes, I did. So um, let me just pull that up real quick because you Jumped blindsided me. I, I know. So what I okay. Do. So the first question is from More Gooder Than Podcast, and it says, "Is it weird to have Batman, Sabretooth, and the Incredible Hulk in one movie? Do you think Keaton introduces himself as Batman on set?" I would hope not, because it was thirty years ago, and he was not a very good Batman. <laughs> Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay. But we don't there's... need comic book nerds at our throats right now. We we've gotten enough negativity towards every group in the world. Well, it's 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 ironic that a movie that desperately needed a superhero in the movie had so many actors that played superheroes uh, or supervillains in the case of Sabretooth. 
Uh, Mark Ruffalo, Hulk, Michael Keaton, Batman, uh, uh, Liv Schreiber, Sabretooth. Didn't you say Stanley Tukey was something? Uh, he was the doctor that made Captain America. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, Billy Crudup was Dr. Manhattan, who is basically God right. in and The Watchmen. Rachel McAdams was in... Um, uh, Dr. Doctor Sh- Strange, but she was the like girlfriend or romantic interest for uh, Benedict Cumberbatch. Still interesting. Uh, John Slattery, one of the characters, was Howard Stark, Tony Stark's father. So that's interesting. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of them in there. I just they this this story needs an actual superhero, and it didn't have one because it's real life and not a comic book, unfortunately. Um. So okay. So I I hadn't chosen which uh, question yet on this one because I didn't know. Have you seen The Revenant? I have. Okay. Good. You can answer this question. I cannot because I have not seen The Revenant. But would Spotlight have been beaten to Best Picture by The Revenant had Alejandro G. Naritu? Not also directed the previous year's Best Picture winner, Birdman. Uh, well, The Revenant was fantastic. Uh, fantastic in a different way. It's also a true story, just like this movie. It's weird. Uh, but I would say that it's really a toss-up, and you could go either way. I would say that I'm fine with this movie having won versus Revenant. I would have also been fine if Revenant had won because they're both fantastic movies. It would have been weird, though, to have the same director and the same main character in Best Picture two years in a row. Best Picture? The main character was... Uh, Birdman was Michael Keaton. Well, but that Spotlight won, whereas... That's what I'm saying. It would have been weird if The Revenant won. I'm answering his question. It would have been weird. Uh, well, it would have been the same director versus the same actor. I guess, but... I, I don't know. I, I have not seen The Revenant. I have not seen... Birdman, but I just think the whole, the, I think it, it's a weird situation because either way you're in a in a weird boat. Right, I I I'm fine with the, how things turned out. I mean, I love this movie, so I also love The Revenant. Okay, and then the other thing I wanted to just do real quick is give a shout out to the Good Doctor seventy four for leaving us a review. Um, it says the movie podcast for you. If you love great analysis presented in an entertaining format, look no further. I love this show. So thank you for leaving us a review. Um, anybody who's listening, if you uh, like the show, leave us a review. Um, helps people find us on iTunes. Um, I have one last thing, and we have to mention it because it was tied back to our first podcast ever. Uh, Liv Schreiber, I, I, while researching this, I found out that he has a brother that's an actor, and his name is Pablo. And Pablo he, Schreiber. Pa- Pablo Schreiber, Yes. And they were both in Manchurian Candidate, the first podcast we have ever done. Interesting. And I just had to throw that out because I found this during Who the research. Who's Pablo Schreiber? I don't think I've heard uh, of him. He's porn stash from Orange is the New Black. Oh. He's also in The Wire and a couple other things that I've seen, but you've not seen The Wire, so. Nope. And you bring it up all the time, but no, I, still haven't seen it's it. Because it's a travesty. Hmm. Well, that's, that's interesting. I didn't know that Liv Schreiber was part of a acting I, family. Me so. neither. But, but who knew? Well, uh, I just I had to throw that really in I also really never know who Liv Schreiber is. He's, like, fluffy in this movie, so I wouldn't have recognized him if you didn't point it out. So, all right. Uh, you have to thank Jake from... Yes, Jake. Yeah. Thank you, Jake, for, for Mathis Music for our intro and outro. And what are we doing next week? Next week is... Uh, Kung Fu Panda, Kung because Fu Panda. it's the 10-year anniversary next Wednesday. And thank you. I was a deer in the headlights right there, which is odd because we just had deer in our yard. Mm, it's true. But this is true. But um, okay, Kung so Fu I'm Panda. looking forward to a light, happy movie next week. Yeah, we could use it. <laughs> All right.